Hey, welcome back, guys, to Petroleum Downstream Crash Course. And this is part two of maximizing the performance of the crude distillation tower. Now, just to save time, I'm using notes from the previous uh, video. And of course, we see that in a distillation unit, we separate the crude oil into various fractions. And we found that uh, we could adjust those fractions. Uh, we can adjust the temperature boiling ranges or the true boiling point uh, of those uh, fractions for various reasons. Of course, one of the first, the first reason being elaborated on was the quantity of product. For example, you want to maximize your kerosene, so you make the boiling point ranges of the kerosene wider so that more liquid can be inside your kerosene cut. Therefore, you can sell more kerosene, you can sell more kerosene and you can make more money. Now, there's another reason why you want to uh, control uh, the stuff in the distillation tower, you want to control the uh, operations of the distillation tower, is to control product quality. So, what do I mean by product quality? Alright, so, what... What do I mean by that? Okay, so first, let's start by talking about the boiling points properly. So this is temperature. This is, let's say, naphtha. So naphtha starts from 90 and goes to 200. You can set it less if you want, if you don't want so much naphtha. And kerosene, this is naphtha cut. Yeah, and for kerosene, kerosene will go probably from here up to 300. That's the maximum. If you want to do jet A1, that's the maximum you got to go. So kerosene would be probably here. Of course, this is ideal when you talk about a distillation tower. The temperature, the boiling ranges, all right, so this is the initial boiling point, IBP. This is the final boiling point, FBP. The same goes here, IBP, FBP. All right. So you want to make sure, uh, yeah, where this IBP ends, uh, where this FBP ends, the next IBP starts. So the final boiling point of naphtha should be 200. And the initial boiling point of kerosene it could be 200 that is of course ideal and that tells you yes the separation is very good uh, there's no temperature overlap in that sense but in reality it's not always like that maybe maybe your kerosene cut can be something like this and your naphtha cut can be something like this So again, IBP, FBP. So same for these things, IBP, FBP. Now what happens if you are yeah, in a situation like this? Well, of course one thing is that your products are going to be quite off spec. Because this has already exceeded the maximum limit for the boiling point. The final boiling point for kerosene or jet A1 fuel is not supposed to be more than 300 degrees C. But if the separation quality in the distillation column is very poor, the final boiling point could be higher than 300 because more of the heavy components are in the kerosene cut. So that means here, that's what I'm talking about. Yep. So that will be in the kerosene cut. Okay? So this is known as overlap. Alright? Overlap in the boiling points. So the naphtha final boiling point. Naphtha final boiling point is more than the kerosene initial boiling point. Okay, 
So I hope that concept is uh, stuck. It sticks well in your head. You understand it. So this is called overlap. Usually. Now, how is it tested in the industry? Well, to ensure that product quality is maintained uh, and there's no such overlap, people use the D86 test, or the otherwise the ASTM D86 test. Uh, this is one of the standard distillation tests uh, elaborated on before in another video, but basically the idea is the same. Except instead of using the actual final boiling point and initial boiling point, the uh, ASTM D86 test is frequently, uh, how to say, usually the points for 95% and 5% of the ASTM D86 test are used. So in this final boiling point, what does it say? This means that 100% of my naphtha has been evaporated or boiled off. So after 100% of the vapor or rather the naphtha has just boiled off, what is the temperature? That's the final boiling point. However, in the industry, instead of 100%, they probably use 95%. So again, the initial boiling point is where 0% of the kerosene or of the substance has boiled off. So the kerosene initial boiling point refers to the point where 0% of the volume has been boiled off. But instead of 0%, industry likes to use 5%. I mean, it's a give and take thing. It's a give and take. Because the, sh the separation here is never as sharp. Because this is an ideal separation. But in a rail unit, there will of course be some degree of overlap. Now, some degree of overlap is actually fine, but too much isn't fine. How much is that too much? Well, the tolerance zone is within this 5%. So they give about 5%, give or take. So let us redefine an overlap. So D86, 95% of the light which is in this case naphtha is more than D86 5% of the heavy carol. Now this is a bad situation. That's what you don't want. What you want instead alright, what you want instead is your D86 5% volume that temperature this in is similar to the initial boiling point just a little uh, higher than the initial boiling point and this should be more than D86 95% volume of the light so the heavy okay let's check I can't remember so the 5% usually refers to the heavy cut and then 95% usually refers to the light cut. Okay, so it's the same reason. So this 95%, you can remember it as close to final boiling point. This one is similar to the initial boiling point. All right, so if you're ever confused, just draw this out again. So this is the IBP. FBP, IBP, FBP. So this is the light because it's more volatile. This is the heavy. It doesn't just apply to naphtha and kerosene. It can apply to kerosene and diesel and so on and so forth. So this is 95%. This is 5%. Alright. So 95% should be lower than 5%. So this is called a gap. And gaps are usually good. It means that you are performing up to par, the separation efficiency is high enough, so you are guaranteed a certain amount of quality. However, if you have an overlap, as described earlier, this is something you do not want. 
It's something you do not want, and therefore, you have to do something to adjust your distillation column. And what do you do to adjust the distillation column? You can adjust the reflux ratio. All right. Reflux ratio you can dis, uh, you can adjust. So again, you have your distillation column here. There'll be a cooler. Okay. So if you increase the flow rate to this cooler, you are going to increase the reflux ratio because the the more cool uh, this fluid is when it flows back into the distillation column, the more vapors it can condense. And the more vapors it can condense, the higher the reflux ratio. And the higher the reflux ratio, all else kept constant, the better the degree of separation. If you can't remember, just go back to the distillation testing video. That will give you a recap of the concepts of distillation. So, Besides the reflux ratio, you can adjust the steam flow rate. So that helps you to strip off the light ends. So if you want, uh, let's say, your fi initial boiling point to be higher, it means that your cut of that product, of this product, your cut of this product has less volatile components. On the whole, it's less volatile. So to do that, you kind of increase your stripping steam. However, you know that increasing stripping steam is going to increase the cooler load. Meaning to say, the more steam you, you inject into your tower, the more steam is going to condense in the overhead. The more steam is going to condense here. So you've got to uh, input more cooling water and other stuff and of course the more sour water you will need to collect thereafter okay so these are just two of the methods that you can use to control the uh, cut points and control your quality of separation inside your distillation column now uh, of course, it's actually a lot more complicated than that, and you cannot just adjust the steam flow rate as and when you wish. However, that will be beyond the scope of this video. For more information, um, I will be putting a few uh, PDFs, uh, or just one PDF you can find online, and I'd like to recommend two books to you, if you are really interested in this. Two books on distillation. And both are by Henry Kister. Okay, one is called Distillation Operations, and the other is called Distillation Design. And these books are written by uh, Kister, who has extensive industry experience. And you can go and read more about his uh, books to find out how uh, real engineers actually go and troubleshoot columns and adjust the uh, adjust the set, the parameters in the column to achieve the desired results. And of course, there'll be a bunch of other uh, resources I'll be putting inside the description. And just to let you know, these are available on Amazon. And you can probably buy them from secondhand uh, dealers. They cost anywhere from uh, 50 US and up, up to 100, depends on your seller and of course the transport costs and depends on where you stay in the world. And of course it doesn't uh, ship to some parts of the world, but that's just to tell you where you can get your books from. All right, so thanks a lot for watching. Hope you have enjoyed this video and hope you have learned something new about distillation and how uh, it's being how the quality of the distillation is being controlled in an actual refinery so thanks uh, please do like subscribe comment if you find this video useful cheers